Peace. Welcome to the C.L. Edwards Podcast, where we are re-imaging the culture, focusing on spirituality, family, work, health, and community. Your host is author, speaker, husband, and father, C.L. Edwards. Now, let's get it started. The roots of my story go back, way back. To West Africa to the east I don't know much about where my ancestors came from or who they were or what they believed in the little I know is that the largest percentage of my DNA originates in Nigeria were they Muslim were they some sort of uh, traditional African spirituality I don't know most likely a mixture of both you know everybody was put onto the slave vessel it didn't matter you know, which tribe or what religion they were they all got shipped and they all ended up in the same place many times on the same plantations to work and they were in many times forced to breed with each other like animals and so I would like to think that Whoever my Muslim ancestors were back in who knows what year, that while they were being transported across the Atlantic Ocean, they offered up a prayer and they they asked Allah if Islam could be preserved in their lineage. If one day their family members could still face the Qibla and give the call to prayer and bow to the Lord's Allah towards the east and you know me and some of my family members we are the answer to that to that prayer now after after that story pits up in the south both sides of my family my father's side comes from Georgia my mother's side comes from Mississippi now the the furthest back I can go on my father's side is to a man named Grant. Grant was born in 1825. Um, it appears so far that I don't believe that he actually was a slave, that he was more of a free man. But somehow, some way, his son ended up working at a plantation, maybe as a freeman. And he met a lady, a lady who... Uh, who was not African-American. She was white and Indian, Native American. And she was the daughter of the owner of the plantation. She fell in love with that, my ancestor, and they got married and they had 12 children. Now, as the story goes is that even though she was the child of uh, plantation owners and slave owners, she never, um, she didn't rest in her white privilege. She identified with the slaves. She would sneak out of the house and go down to the slave quarters and, and eat with the slaves and be with them. She felt more comfortable with them than she felt with her own family and her own people. I guess that's how she met you know, my great, great grandfather and how they fell in love and got married. Um, like I said, they had 12 children and the records that I've shown, uh, I've been able to find, shows them as being mulatto. But you know, they were black. <laughs> they were, they were, uh, as far as culture-wise, they were all the way black. Now something happened. We don't know what. That forced a, uh, forced them to move. All of a sudden, they packed up and moved and went to Canada. And stayed in Canada for around three years. And then after leaving. Uh, they left Canada and crossed back over uh, the Ambassador Bridge into Detroit. You know, the story goes that, you know, my, uh, my grandfather and my grandmother actually hid in the back of a car while a friend of theirs drove them over the Ambassador Bridge back into Detroit. And they ended up buying a house on the east side of Detroit. And that's where they had a family. And out of that, 
you know, my father met my mother. Now, on my mother's side, as I said earlier, her family came. She actually was born in Mississippi, southern Mississippi. Now, I have family in southern Mississippi and northern Louisiana. And it's the deep south. Mississippi is notorious as being uh, a place of segregation, a place of racism, you know, a, a place of poverty, even for the white people. And my mother, you know, she firsthand experienced Jim Crow and, you know, uh, water fountains that had whites only, black only, having to go to, you know, you go to the store, you had to go through the back door. You couldn't be served at the counter. And my great grandfather, whose name was Danny John, Daddy John, that's what they called him. He was the product of rape. His mother was only 14 years old. She was on a, a plantation and the, the, the son of the slave master, he raped my great grandmother. That's how my great grandfather came to be. And he had a child and that child married my grandfather. They produced my mother. And they ended up moving to Detroit. Now, they were very religious people. They actually, my family, and I was able to see this when I, when I went down to visit where they came from. They were very religious people. They ended up becoming Baptist. Who knows what the family was before in Africa when it came over? Who knows? That's lost. But um, they were missionary Baptists. And they, helped, they actually founded and built with their own hands two different missionary churches in this small town in Mississippi. And I was told by my great grand, my grandfather is that both churches at different times were attacked by the KKK. One church was that actually set on fire twice by the KKK. So the living conditions in, down there, the racism, the terrorism of the KKK, the lack of opportunity and the, and the poverty, they couldn't take it anymore and they moved. And this is the story of many African Americans. It's something called the Great Migration, where millions of African Americans moved from the deep south, deep south, and they moved to the north. They left places like Mississippi, Alabama, North Carolina, South Carolina, um, Arkansas. They left these places to move north. Some of them went to New York. Some of them went to Philadelphia, Detroit, uh, Chicago, uh, Milwaukee, uh, Indianapolis, uh, different cities, even L.A., Oakland, to find a better life, to get away from uh, the rampant racism. But what, unfortunately, what they found was that the North just had a different type of uh, segregation. The North had a different type of systematic racism waiting for them. And many of them, they may have gotten jobs in the auto industry, warehouses, airports, and they, and they made some money. But eventually, what happened when they were segregated into certain parts of these cities, those cities were deprived of economic uh, opportunity. Uh, the whites boycotted them economically. They weren't allowed to apply for certain jobs, or if, you, if, they, if they were able to apply, they weren't considered or hired. Or they got hired in at the lowest possible position, and they never were able to get out of that position or to ascend into the, into the organization to get another position, become managers. That wasn't, that wasn't for them. So what eventually happened is these, these areas, these, these ghettos, these ethnic ghettos that they were corralled into um, soon became places of poverty and many times crime. This could be investigated that even the uh, United States government either played an active role or set by and allowed drugs to come into these communities. They allowed heroin, cocaine, and later crack cocaine during the crack epidemic to invade these these communities 
and the event I lived through the crack era in Detroit and crack cocaine was like a biological weapon that was dropped into my community it destroyed the community you had a proud black community yeah we had issues there were people that were that were poor there were people that were on drugs but many of the people were hard-working people people who took pride in their homes many of them were homeowners a city like Detroit had the highest the highest level of black home ownership anywhere else in the whole entire nation and this was because of the blue-collar jobs that black people were able to get after you know migrating from the south to the north but as you know as different policies in the government changed and the good hard-working uh, blue-collar jobs were shipped out of America and sent overseas to places where goods could be manufactured at a lower price these thing and many other people even whites working class whites they lost these good paying jobs and this area in America you know some people call it flyover country some people refer to it as you know the aging aging area of, uh, of America places like um, Pennsylvania Ohio Michigan uh, Indian, Indiana, Illinois, upstate New York it used to be very uh, great areas for people to live in, but now it's abandoned buildings, underdevelopment, unemployment, drugs of all types, methamphetamine, crank, heroin, opioids, cocaine, marijuana have taken over. And people, because of their depression and their lack of opportunities, have turned to these drugs and alcohol as well. Because alcohol is the number one drug in America. And a lot of people don't want to talk about that, but it's a reality. And people turn to these things because they don't have any hope and they want to escape reality at all costs. That sets up an opportunity for the corporate world and the government to collaborate and create the prison industrial complex, militarized police, over policing of certain neighborhoods and areas, school to prison pipelines. All these things have come into existence in the last 50 years. And it's left some people in some areas devastated while leaving other areas highly privileged and unequal financially. This is what America has come to. This is what the nation I was born into, not because of choice, but because of circumstances, has come to. Now, we have to really look at this. These are the circumstances and the environment that I was born into. And many people like me. It's not that I'm special or that I'm different from anyone else. Now, I saw the breakdown of my family. You know, my grandparents, great grandparents, great uncles, and they had 50 year marriages. The people got married while they were young and they stayed together. They didn't break up. Family stayed family, even though there were issues, there were problems, there was alcoholism, and people may have cheated. You know, some people had what are called outside kids. Yeah. You know that existed but no matter what they stayed together but in the 70s and the 80s with the influx of feminist ideology a new form of the family came into existence you know the feminist model of the family the nuclear family the traditional family was moved out the way it wasn't it wasn't modern anymore it wasn't sexy anymore it was outdated and old-fashioned what they promoted to the people through books through colleges through entertainment was that being a single mother was um, winning that it was some type of victory that it was cool it was something not to be afraid of or to run away from but to embrace and again just like drugs this just like crack cocaine and liquor stores had a devastating devastating effect on the community I lived in this ideology and this new form of family equally had a devastating effect. It's almost like 
being bombed from every side, being surrounded and shot at from every side. How do you defend yourself? How do you defend your way of life? You can't. And the people in my community, they couldn't. So I watched the destruction of the family. I watched the destruction of the black community. I watched the destruction of one of the most prosperous cities in America right before my eyes as a child. And it was, it was very traumatic. It was very traumatic. It was very traumatic. Not only this, but environmental trauma. The place I was born in was next, literally across the street from an industrial park. Later on, we would come to find out that the area was poisoned with lead. And the children who grew up there had extremely high levels of lead in their blood system. In fact, in the city of Detroit, on average, children have had um, a large amount of exposure to lead and mercury, more so than any other place, more so than any other city or area in Michigan or Metro Detroit, and certainly other cities in America. Again, environmental warfare being perpetuated against a group of people. And then people have the nerve to come from other nations and other places and ask, well, why aren't black people prospering? You know, we are having businesses. We have these jobs. Why don't the African-Americans? Well, you don't know the history. You don't know what has happened and you don't know what has going on at the moment. So you were invited and allowed to come into America so America can use your labor or your um, intellectual resources for its own benefit. But they had a completely different agenda for my people and where I came from. They tried to get rid of us. And it's only a miracle of Allah, Almighty God, that we still exist and that we still are still hanging on to existence. And many of us, many of us are even prospering. That is, that is the origin story of C.L. Edwards. That is the ground that the seed of C.L. Edwards was planted in. And that's where I came up. That's where I came up.